So you might think defending the Christian faith is just a small discipline within theology. Well, you might be surprised that there are several styles, and these styles come with their own extensive literature. There are about four main types of Christian apologetics, classical, evidential, presuppositional, and fideism. And in this video, I would like to look with you to, um, no, at fideistical apologetics. And again, I'm not going into depth, but I would like to explain a little bit more about what it is and how we might use it in everyday life. A fideist is, a fideist is someone who relies on faith rather than reason when in pursuit of religious truth. And, and the word fideism is actually, um, they, they have actually borrowed it from the French language where they say uh, fideisme. Um, and, and the French in their turn borrowed it from the Latin word fide, which means truth, belief and faith. And then the French actually just added ism to it. So this should already give us uh, a clue of what uh, fideistic apologetics uh, and what a fideistic apologist tries to do, right? Rather than depending on one's intellect, a fideist emphasizes faith over reason. Now that is not to say that they will completely shut down their brains, no, but it's more that they rely on faith because they believe faith is a gift of God, from God. They argue that we cannot fully understand God because our reasoning is limited. And a very famous verse we could use to defend this idea can be found in um, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 where it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. But... Um, this text can be explained differently if we ex uh, emphasize uh, grace as being the gift. So the, the verses we read in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 to 13, seem to make this point a little bit more clear for, for the fideist, that is. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom te teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Now, let me give you some examples. I think this um, approach does make a lot of uh, sense. Not to say that I would only use this approach, but in some cases I just trust more in faith than in reason. You see, um, a good example can be the doctrine of the Trinity, for example. And even though I've listened to numerous great uh, explanations, I'm still puzzled by some aspects of this concept. Uh, maybe others are just a little bit smarter than I am, that's, that's okay, but in this case I often rely on faith. And what about God's nature, for example? It's a field of study that doesn't seem to end. God is love, God is good, God is just, and so on and, and so forth. Pretty often I rely on faith rather than being able to capture his nature in a, in a sound mathematical way of reasoning. So these attributes of God are so complex that it might be better to talk about them um, out of faith. Uh, when an unbeliever asks me about them, I, I try to give examples. And then when I'm stuck, I often admit that this is something I just decided to believe through faith as given by the Holy Spirit. Some would argue that fideism is not part of apologetics at all. Like, uh, taking this approach seems to discount the more rational styles of defending the faith. However, it might be a bit different if we look at what Mr. Evans said about fideism. Evans says that we have to make the distinction between um, irrational fideism, which denies uh, that, um, that we can or should think rationally uh, or log logically about matters of faith, and he says, responsible fideism, which tries to give a reasoned case for viewing faith. 
So this second group believes that it is justified to reason about faith even though they believe that everything about Christianity is above, beyond and in some sense against reason. Uh, what they mean by reason is human reason or rationality. They argue that we cannot fa um, uh, understand these matters by the use of the human mind. In other words, they say that some truths of Christianity are far beyond our capacity to understand or express in a logical, uh, definite, uh, definitive fashion. And you know what? Honestly, I think they have a very good point here. I'm, we don't have to answer the unbeliever with a blunt answer like, oh, you just have to believe. You just need to believe. Now, instead, uh, when we are confronted with very difficult topics or questions, we might try to explain why reason is incompetent to give an ex uh, acceptable answer, and then showing that faith does provide a way to think through the problem. I think, actually, when I, when I got to think about it, that this approach isn't very popular in the more Western parts of the world. By this, I mean the part of the world where we were more or less... Uh, influenced by theologians like uh, Aquinas. So what, what does Aquinas have to do with this, you might ask? Well, for this we need uh, just a little bit of history. Just after the Council of uh, uh, Chalcedon, um, which was held in 551 AD, we see that what we call now the, the Great Schism. This schism, this division of churches, was about the idea of whom the Holy Spirit proceeded. In the Nicene Creed, uh, the Church Fathers said that the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father, but Pope Leo, and with him many others by the way, said that the Holy Spirit proceeded from both the Father and the Son, and he wanted to add this to the Creed. Now, th this Nicene Creed was very important for all Christians, and as a consequence, many from mostly the Eastern Church refused to add anything else to this Creed. Well, long story short, the Pope said yes, they said no, and they both went their own way, and this is called the Great Schism. From this point on, uh, we had two major churches, namely the Western Catholic and the Easter, uh, Eastern Orthodox. And both churches had their giants in theology. The Catholic Church was strongly influenced by people like Aquinas. And Aquinas basically taught that we can describe who God is. He said that God isn't made out of parts, but rather that he is. For example, God is love. And love is not just a part of God. And this way of thinking made it possible for Christians to study the things of God. But not only that, if we can study God, we can also study that what he has made. So in other words, we can do theology in an academic way. And this has led to the study of all sorts of sciences. Now, whatever your atheistic or secular teacher wants you to believe, the church boosted academic sciences. The church never suppressed science or scientists. This is a myth that gained popularity in the Renaissance. Um, I mean, the time they put, for example, Galileo on trial was not about uh, his scientific um, tr um, efforts, but it was because he, he wasn't showing his evidence. That's why they put him on trial. Well, anyway, um, just ask a serious historian and they will admit this. Okay, back on topic. Um, we might have difficulties trusting things on faith basis because of our scientific uh, disposition. This might be very different, as I said, in the Easter Orthodox Church. Uh, this church was uh, strongly influenced by theologians like uh, Palamas. And, and people like Palamas believe that we can perceive God's energy and through that we can understand what God does, but we cannot understand or even contemplate uh, God's essence itself. And the consequence is that up till today, the Easter Orthodox Church rather talks about what God is not instead of what God is and what he is. So they will, for example, not say God is all-powerful, but they rather say that God is not limited by anything. In other words, that what God is, is more or less a mystery. And this is why we see more mis mysticism in the Eastern Orthodox Church, and I guess the fideistical style of apologetics might appeal more to them than to Western Christians. I, I guess this is just my take on it. But don't forget about Mr. Luther. 
Martin Luther. Fideism can be found in the Lutheran traditions as well. Not to say that Luther was a full-blown Fideist, but it is not hard to find key elements within his life and that of his followers. Luther said that forgiveness of sins is a gift of God through faith alone. He argued that we humans needed this gift um, and we needed it because of our bondage to sin. A, spirit, uh, a spiritual bondage which is so strong that the human mind simply cannot, um, uh, cannot know anything substantial about the creator or anything concerning his work. Luther strongly believed that we cannot even understand how the libera uh, liberating truth of the gospel works. Now, instead he said, we can only know these things through the work of the Holy Spirit. You see that Luther wasn't really positive about human reasoning. When it comes to the everlasting matters of life in the kingdom of heaven, Luther looked at nature as absolutely stone blind, he said, and human reason as completely incompetent. He concluded that God is not subject to reason and syllogisms, uh, but to the word of God and faith. It might well be that this triggered Luther to translate the Bible in the normal language. He believed that whatever we can know about God comes through faith as given by the Holy Spirit and through the scriptures. And I actually can relate uh, to this because I have noticed that many in the countryside of Madagascar don't really understand the gospel. They have heard it being preached in the official language, but that language is far removed from their dialects. And I've seen firsthand how eyes were opened when people uh, heard the gospel in their own dialect. When I read from the Gospel of Luke, which my Malagasy friend and I translated in a Malagasy dialect called Antanala, I, I see understanding coming down on the people. And Luther said, let us not be anxious. The gospel needs not our help. It is sufficiently strong of itself. God alone comm commands it. Okay, but what can we do with this kind of apologetics? Well, um, even though many seem to prefer some solid evidence, we are bound to meet people who are more orientated on, and I do it like this, emotional aspects of life. I have met many who aren't much interested in science or worldviews or whatever. And as soon as I started to talk about the ins uh, insurance of just believing that Jesus, sa Jesus saved me, they were completely intrigued. They wanted to know more about this faith that gives me rest of heart, because that is what faith does, right? You don't have to run after all the knowledge you can get. You don't have to worry about all the so-called proofs against religion. Likewise, you just believe that what the Holy Spirit assures you of. I mean, that's, that, that is what faith does. Um, I remember clearly that some, somewhere around 2008, I think, um, I saw a, saw a short doc, a documentary about a fossil called Ida. And Mr. David Attenborough boldly proclaimed that this fossil would finally do away with religion. Now people can say, okay, you say we're, we're, we're primates, like monkeys and apes, uh, and that we came from very uh, simple, generalized uh, mammals. Show us the link. The link, they would have said, until now, is missing. Uh, well, it is no longer missing. She could rewrite science. She could confirm Darwinian theory and debunk creationism. She could also question religion itself. All in all, she's quite a find. This fossil was the ancestor of human beings. And I know that there were quite a few Christians who got in trouble with their faith because of this. I didn't really have an answer either so uh, to this attack, so yeah, what to do? Uh, it was a, a straight attack on the creation story of the Bible. However, I also realized that I never could understand this creation event to its full extent anyway. So at that point, I decided to trust God's word through faith. Well, some ridiculed my position. Um, what more proof did I need to abandon my childish idea of creation, right? Even Christians said that. Uh, but I didn't have to wait long because a year later, in 2009, I found two tiny 
articles, one from the New York Times and one in, uh, in the BBC News, that both basically said that Ida was only a kind of a lemur. So Mr. Attenborough she cheered uh, too soon. He was happy too soon. And my skeptical friends urged me to abandon my stance of, on creation too soon as well. Sadly enough, some other Christians were less stubborn in their faith than I am. Uh, Apologetics is great, but only when we are aware of our shortcomings. We just can't have all the answers. Relying on the Holy Spirit for faith is a very wise thing to do. Fideism definitely deserves a place in our theological arsenal. In any case, uh, do let me know what you think in the comments. Maybe you disagree on certain things. Just leave a comment and remember, as always, I'm mostly active on my Odyssey channel. Uh, you'll find a link to that channel in the description of this video and on my website. If you like what I'm doing, you can subscribe to my channel and don't forget to hit that notification bell if you want to be informed every time I upload a new video. I'm, uh, I very much appreciate your prayers and support. Uh, please take a look in the description again of this video or on my website to find out how you can help me. Also, I'll place a link here down here to both the Dutch and English transcripts of this video. I want to wish you God's rich blessing. Thank you for watching and Lord willing, we'll see each other in the next video. Thank you for watching this video. You can give me a thumbs up if you liked it. You can also subscribe to my channel or even better, follow me on Odyssey. That way you will never miss a new video. You will find all the links in the description below.